Today we're going to continue this series uh, that we started last week about the stories of Jesus. And we're looking through these stories that Jesus told in the book of Matthew. And uh, today we're going to talk about the story of good seeds and wicked weeds. Good seeds and wicked weeds. Now, some of you, you think of wicked weed, you think of a, a weed that is illegal, and that's not what we're talking about, okay? So if you're, if you're that person thinking about that, then put that out of your mind. Uh, we are gonna talk about this story of, in the old King James Version, it says the wheat and the tares. And so a tear was simply a weed. And so we're gonna look at that. We're also gonna look at the story of Jesus told about the story of a sower and seeds. Now, I grew up in North Carolina. Most of you know that if you've been coming here. As a kid, I worked on my grandpa's farm and I also worked in our garden. Now, I got paid to work on my grandpa's farm. I did not get paid to work. Well, my dad said I got paid by getting to eat uh, by working in our garden and I hated it. I, you know, isn't that amazing, like something that you hate when you're a kid or a teenager, you actually love as you're an adult? Isn't that funny? Because I thought, man, I'll never work in garden again. But man, it's so therapeutic to be able to do that. Uh, but I worked on that farm and I got paid to work on that. But I still, I like getting paid. I did not like the work because my grandpa's on both sides of my family, my dad's uh, family and my mom's family were both tobacco farmers. Tobacco farmers. Now, if you've never worked on a, on a tobacco farm or in a tobacco field, count yourself blessed, all right? Because basically, back then at least, we would have to work in the field and harvest the tobacco. We'd plant the tobacco. We'd transplant the tobacco. We would go through and chop all the weeds out of the tobacco. We would Break, break the flowers out, and we called them suckers and topping the tobacco. In fact, we did not say tobacco. Where I grew up in North Carolina, you said biker. Now, that, I know that sounds weird, like a biker on a bike. No, it, it was a shortened form of tub biker, all right? Not tobacco, but tobiker. And so all my family said, go and go work in some biker fields, you know? And I a biker field, you're going to ride a bike? No. Uh, but I grew up on that farm, working on my grandpa's farm. Now, the interesting thing about that farm is we did grow things other than tobacco. For example, we grew corn, soybeans, wheat, okra in the garden. Okra, anybody? Only fried okra. Otherwise, it is a sin against God's laws, all right? If you like slimy okra, then God bless you, you're going to hell. All right, so I'm just kidding about that. But it'll make you feel like you're in hell if you eat the, uh, the slimy, slimy, greasy okra that's not fried. But we ate um, squash and grew cucumbers and tomatoes and green beans and we even grew green peas, which are not fit for human consumption. I do not know why anybody grows green peas. I don't know why anybody eats green peas. My mom would try to trick me into eating green peas. And my wife, we've been married 36 years. She still tries to get me to eat green peas. I do not know why. I, I would just rather be slapped upside the head than eat green peas. You may like green peas, but God bless you, all right? We would grow onions and we grow carrots and potatoes and Brussels sprouts and peppers and then fruits. We grew grapes and apples and peaches and plums and cherries but we mostly grew tobacco. Now, did you know, and, and this really has nothing to do with my message, I just think it's kind of a cool stat. Uh, did you know that in one ounce of tobacco seeds, there are over 500,000 seeds in one ounce? That's a lot, isn't it, okay? Once again, that has nothing to do with my message. I just thought you'd like to know that, all right? So, now here's the thing. I talked about all these seeds, all these things that we grow, and a seed does one of two things. It either produces fruit or it's ruined. Okay, I want you to get the picture. This is a beautiful metaphor. It's a brilliant metaphor that Jesus gave. Uh, seed will either produce fruit and as a result feed people. It produces fruit. Or if it does not get planted, it does not fulfill its purpose. Uh, it does not 
uh, produce fruit either to continue planting or feeding people. And all it does is it will ruin. And a seed that is not planted will either rot or it'll go bad. And eventually it is completely ruined. And here's what seeds that get planted do. You may not know this. This is not like a farming lesson, but uh, this is what every seed that gets planted does if it's gonna produce fruit, all right? It first of all dies. Did you know that? When you plant a seed, it has to die. And then it resurrects. And then it grows and then it produces fruit. Is that not a beautiful picture of what happens to a Christian? When we talk about dying, we're not talking about the physical death, um, but we all are born dead spiritually. You say, what does that mean? Well, we are both positionally and actually sinners. That's what that means. He said, what do you mean by positionally and actually? Well, the Bible says, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And that just simply means you are born and because you are spiritually dead, that means separated from God, not on your way to heaven. Little babies go to heaven, children, uh, if they die before they're able to receive Christ. But you are spiritually separated from God. That's called spiritual death. And and that was what God said would happen in the Garden of Eden. Remember, he told Adam and Eve, he said, the day that you eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll die. And they did die. They died spiritually, separated from God. They eventually died physically. So because death has passed upon all all men uh, because we sin. What that simply means is you're born a sinner. And so whether or not you are a good person by the world's standards, you're still separated from God. That's why it's it's insane to try to approach God on your own goodness because you are born separated. You're born literally a sinner, okay? And, And you say, well, why do you mean you're born a sinner? Have you ever had to teach a child to lie? No. Have you ever had to teach a child to be selfish. No. Uh, The fact is, we are born knowing how to sin. Why? Because we are uh, positionally sinners. That's what it means. But we're also actually sinners. In other words, we actually do sin. Do you understand what I mean by that? Okay, so we're born spiritually dead, separated from God. But that's not what I'm talking about. In order to die and then resurrect and then grow and then produce fruit, what I'm talking about is we have to die to our way of approaching God. You see, as human beings, we love meritocracies. You know what I mean when I say that? Now, a meritocracy is simply when you merit something, you earn something. And that's a good thing in most things. Um, In fact, the Bible does teach that there are parts of our life that we should merit, we should do good uh, in order to receive the reward. The Apostle Paul even wrote in the New Testament that if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. That's a meritocracy. In other words, you put in the work and you are able to eat, feed yourself, feed your family, and so forth. You see, in the church that he was writing to, Paul, when he wrote this, there was a group of people They said, well, you know, Jesus is coming again, so we shouldn't even work. And they were mooching off of everybody else. And so the Bible shows that. And in many ways, uh, the Bible does teach that if you want to be wealthy, then you earn the money. If you want to accumulate more, you got to be disciplined in how you deal with your money. So the Bible is filled with things that deal with merit. However, when it comes to our relationship with God, you don't earn it. It's not merit. And the reason it's not is because of what I said earlier, that you are born positionally a sinner. You are born positionally separated from God, and you're actually a sinner. That's why it doesn't matter if you're a moral person. Well, it matters. You should be moral. But I'm talking about in relationship with God, to 
you know, to say, well, God, I've been a good person. And we hear this, this is so common. I've been a good person. God wouldn't put me into hell. I don't deserve hell. The fact is, we'll show you from scripture that because of being positionally a sinner, you're separated from God. And that's why we need a savior. Okay. And, and you can say, well, I've been a pretty good person all my life. It doesn't matter. And that's why the Bible says all have sinned. All have sinned, even the best among us, even the most moral among us, we all sin. And it says that we all fall short of God's standard. Now, here's the point of scripture on this. If the standard is perfection, if the standard is God himself, the absolute perfection of holiness and righteousness, the absolute definition of what is good and right and holy, how can you possibly measure up to that? You can't. No matter how good you are, no matter how hard you try, no matter how moral you are. Therefore, when it comes to salvation, there is no such thing as a meritocracy. There is no such thing as earning God's favor. And a lot of Christians fail to understand this, that after they're saved, then they want to switch back into the meritocracy mode. In other words, I earn God's love. I don't mean to be shocking to you, but no matter what you do, no matter how good or bad you may be after you're a Christian, I want you to listen closely. You cannot make God love you anymore. You cannot make him love you any less. His love is is without condition, okay? And, and if you think that the way to be right with God and to please God with your life is by trying harder, well, should you be determined? Yes. Determination's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, should you try? Should you uh, put forth effort? The, the Bible is not against our effort. Grace, God's grace is not against effort. It is against believing that your own effort is what saves you or makes you righteous or sanctifies you or makes you grow. That was a long way to say that what we mean by that when a seed is put in the ground, that it must first die. What I mean by that is you must die to your own way of approaching God. You must die to the idea that you're going to earn God's favor by how good you are. You must die to self. You must die to the idea that by keeping the Ten Commandments, you're right with God, or by being a good person, or by being honest, that you're right with God. That is the wrong way to approach. And we're going to see in this passage, we're going to read why that's wrong. Okay? So, what we mean is you got to die. And then what happens? When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, when you admit that you have sinned, when you admit that you cannot do this on your own, when you admit by faith to God that you're gonna trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, what happens? The Bible calls it being born again, coming to life. And so what the Bible teaches is if we're gonna be right with God, we gotta die and then we come back to life and then we grow and then we produce fruit. So I wanna show you today three types of people that I believe the Bible shows us uh, in the passage we're gonna read. Matthew 13, beginning of verse one. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables. Now a parable is just simply a story, okay? And here's what he said. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Can I tell you this, that in this context and in the first century Jewish mind, a bird often represented, it was a metaphor for the enemy, for Satan, for demons, or whatever. So a bird that would come along and snatch this seed in this story would be Satan or your own self, that your rebellion against God, the idea that you reject the word. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. And the other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. 
I, I want you to know that I believe in this story, and some people disagree with me, and that's fine, but I believe there are three saved types in this story and one lost type. You say, why is that? Because uh, three of these seeds literally did grow, okay? Now, not all of them produced fruit, but they all grew. And so they had to die, and then they grew. So that's my personal opinion as we read this. And so uh, he said, they, others fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then skip down to verse number 24, and he tells another story that's related to this. It's also a sower. And it says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. And so when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the master of the house came and said to him, um, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barns. So once again, I've set this up. Seeds that are going to produce fruit and going to fulfill God's purpose. By the way, any seed that does not die, come to life through resurrection, grow and produce fruit, fruit does not fulfill God's purpose for seeds. Because when a seed produces fruit, what can it do? It can feed people. And it can be planted to grow more seed, okay? So your purpose in life, we're the seeds, if you're wondering in this story, we are the seeds. And so your purpose in life, God has created you to love you forever. He wants a relationship with you. And your purpose is to die, to resurrect, to grow, and to produce fruit. So, I want to just show you three kinds of people in this story that I believe that we can relate to. Number one is lost people. The story with a sower that sowed seeds and it says some fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. I believe those people are what we refer to as lost people. In other words, people that don't believe in Christ, people that have not, not that they don't believe in him, but they've not put their faith in him. There are a lot of people that believe that Jesus existed, but they're not saved. So we're talking about lost people, people that do not have a relationship with God the way he prescribes. Remember, die to our own way of thinking, die to self. Then we are resurrected. Then we grow. Then we produce fruit. So I believe you can put these people into one of two categories. People that have heard the gospel and rejected it, and then people who have never heard. Remember, these seeds fell by the wayside. Let me read you some verses. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You have to die to your way. When you receive Christ by faith, you're resurrected, uh, both literally, uh, eventually, and spiritually, but whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. So once again, explaining this, when you're born, what happens? You're born a sinner. You're separated from God. God is not looking throughout the world for wicked sinners to pour out his wrath on. The Bible says that when you're born separated from God because of our position, our positional sin and our actual sin, that God's wrath is already on. In other words, that we're already spiritually dead. We're already separated from God. God's not looking for people to go, oh, you did what I don't like. Oh, you, you believe what I don't believe. 
He's not looking for people. This is already on us. Does that make sense? Okay, so there are people already, every person that's born is born positionally a sinner. He said, so if you don't believe, if you don't have faith, then God's wrath remains. You want God's wrath removed off of you? Believe, trust in Christ. Do what the seeds are supposed to do. Die to self, resurrect in Christ, grow and produce fruit. But then there are those that I believe uh, who are lost, but they have never heard the gospel. Listen to Romans uh, 10, 14. But how shall they, lost people, how shall they ask him, talking about Jesus, how shall they ask Jesus to save them unless they believe in him? Remember that, that's key, that faith, that belief in him. And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? Good question, right? How can a person believe in Jesus if they've never heard about Jesus? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Do you know what this does? This puts a burden a responsibility, not only just on the church, God's gathering, it also puts a burden on every individual Christian. You see, we are responsible to help people here. So every time you come to the gathering, and, and, and I hear people often, particularly in this culture, uh, talk about, well, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm just not religious. That is a big cop out, okay? Jesus died for the church. You know what the the word church literally means, the gathering, okay? And people are like, well, you know, I'm a part of the universal church. I'm a part of God's church, and I don't have to go to a local congregation. Well, you must have never read the New Testament, okay? Because that's not the way it works. And I know a lot of people are like, oh, man, that, you know, I just kind of, I'll watch all these different podcasts and I'll do whatever. But The truth is, there is a reason that God has the church. And one of those reasons, I'm not getting into the defense of the church, but one of the things that you cannot do apart from a church, a gathering, a group, a family that comes together, one of the things you cannot do is fulfill the commission that God has given us. How will they believe in him unless they have heard about him? And did you know that God says that we have a responsibility to take the gospel to the whole world? One person cannot do that. It is impossible for you to learn every language of the world, to translate scripture into every language of the world, to go to every country in the world, every people group in the world. That is an impossibility for a person to do, one person. But did you know that collectively across the world, as local churches, part of the big C church, do you know that we can conquer that problem? Because we give and we serve and we're a part. Every time you do that, you know what you're doing? You're helping fulfill this commission that God has given us. And so it is important because when we gather together, And through the power of the church worldwide, we're able to get the gospel to every person. Can't do it by yourself. And if you think that you can fulfill all of God's purpose and plan for your life, apart from being a part of a local church, you are sadly, sadly mistaken. So these are lost people. Here's the second group of people we see. We see saved people. Now that's wonderfully simple, lost and saved. We use those terms for Christians, followers of Christ, people that have received Christ, people that step across the line of faith, the born again, believers, whatever you want, whatever term you want to use, the Bible does say the word saved, that that we are saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? So, Uh, It's important that we understand that in this story, there are what we would say are saved people, saved people. Now, let let me show you the three types of seed or the the three types of soil uh, that this seed grew in. And I want to see which one you're in. You have to ask yourself this question, which one am I in? First of all, I would say we see the discouraged person. 
You say, what does that mean? Well, remember when it said that there was seed that fell on rocky soil and it immediately sprang up? And here's what it said, because they had no depth of roots. And I'm telling you that there are people, and, that, that, and it said that the sun, the heat scorched it and burned it, caused it to be unfruitful. I believe that there are discouraged people that they think that because of a past hurt, they don't want to continue with the church. They don't want to continue serving God. They don't want to continue because they just feel hurt. And maybe you're like that. Maybe you experienced some kind of bad experience with church in the past or with someone that you loved or someone that you thought was a Christian and you've been hurt. And then there are people that are suffering And because of the suffering in the world, they've been hurt and they think, man, I cannot go on. And what happens is often discouraged people will do just this. They'll quit. Why? Because the heat gets to them. Let me show you how to get out of that position and how you can survive. Let me show you how. It's in Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3, talking about people that follow God. It says, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. And they are like trees planted by the riverbank. You know what that means? They got roots. They, they get the word of God in them. They are a part of the church. They are participating. They get roots. And it says they'll bear fruit each season. By the way, Do not mistake the seasons of your spiritual life um, with that God, or, or compare it to that God is not with you. Did you know that all of us will have winter in our life spiritually? I mean, the truth is, we, I mean, that's just the, the actual truth. Sometimes we're in the summertime and we're seeing harvest and we're seeing God bless. And I love the summer, I hate the winter. I like spring. Spring's a beautiful time. It, things are growing. It, it's getting warm again. The fall, I like that pretty good. I mean, the fact is the leaves are pretty and all this stuff, but I don't like winter. But I'm going to tell you this. There are going to be seasons in your life. And sometimes we have to go through winter. Do you know what winter does? It makes you appreciate the other seasons. Now, if you're weird and you like winter, then this doesn't apply to you, okay? So, uh, I, I, the older I get, the less I like winter. But here's what I know. There are going to be seasons. And sometimes it's going to feel like that you're not growing, that you're not making any progress, that you're not being effective. You can even sometimes feel from, distant from God, like, God, you're not hearing me. You're not answering my prayers. But let me tell you this. Winter is necessary for the harvest to come. Without winter, you will never have the harvest. And so what we need to learn is that there are people that are discouraged, but don't quit, get deep roots. That's the point. Here's the second group in this, the saved people, is distracted people. They get distracted. Verse 22 says this, for what was sown among thorns, this is one who hears the word, but the cares of the world And the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. There are people that are saved. I believe in their heart they love God. But they get distracted. They're deceived to believe that the money, the riches of this world are more important than their relationship with God. They would never verbally say that. They would never acknowledge that, but that's why it's so deceitful. The cares of this world. Let me ask you a question. Are you busy? That's a silly question, isn't it? My dad, he's retired. He said, I've never been so busy in my life as I am right now. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to retire then, you know. But the truth is, you're always going to be busy. And the cares of life can choke out your fruitfulness. It could be your schedule. I should say it this way. Everyone has a schedule. An unmastered schedule will choke the fruitfulness out of you. You see, here's the thing about a schedule. 
you can't do everything. I don't care how good you are, how much energy you have. You're not Superman. You're not Superwoman. You cannot do everything. There are some things that you must learn. And one of the things, if you're going to please God, if you're going to have margin in your life, you got to learn the power of no. Some people have never learned that. And, and you cannot keep adding to, adding to. Now, there's nothing wrong with having beautiful things. There's nothing wrong with uh, vacation and there's nothing wrong with having hobbies. These are wonderful things that can recreate you and help you, but be careful that they don't become the priority in your life. That's what he's saying, that there are people that they are distracted. I'll get around to that one day and they don't realize that that day's never gonna come. Man, as soon as the kids get a little older, we're going to, as soon as this traveling season is over, we're going to, and look, there can be a million things that you could put in that, but don't be distracted. And then the third person is the fruitful person. He said, some of them produce a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. Now, what does that mean? Well, it could be, could be talent. That's possible. There are some people that have more talent, more responsibility, more ability than others. The Bible does say that pastors are going to be judged more harshly than people that are not pastors. Um, that's not a pleasant thought to think about, but the point is that God holds pastors accountable, okay? Uh, because we guard your soul. We try to teach you the word of God, and if we don't do a good job of that, we're going to stand before God and give an account for that. Maybe it's talent. Maybe it's opportunity. I don't know. It could be levels of involvement, though. And here's, here's what I ask. Are you a hundredfold person? Are you giving it all you got? Are you faithful? Are you being a good steward of your time and your talent and your opportunities? It seems to suggest here that um, there are different levels, okay? So you got to ask yourself the question, what am I? Am I deceived? Am I discouraged? Or am I fruitful? And if I am fruitful, am I giving it 100% or 60% or 30%? Don't get me wrong. I appreciate everybody that's involved. But the truth, and we're not trying to create this burden but the fact is, you must be the one that decides, I'm giving 100%. I'm giving it all I got. Don't worry, you're not being judged by your effort. Remember, grace, you cannot please God, I'm, I'm sorry, you cannot have God love you more than he loves you right now. But are you responding the way we should respond to God's grace? And here's the last thing. I got a minute and 53 seconds. They're deceived people. Uh, the weeds looked like the wheat. They were alongside the wheat, but they are not the wheat. You must understand that the enemy is the one that sows weeds and his purpose is to deceive. There are people that go to church that are deceived. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29, the apostle Paul speaking, Luke wrote, the book of Acts, but he was quoting the apostle Paul who was speaking to a group of pastors at Ephesus. And he said, beware. He said, there are going to be false teachers that arise. There are wolves. He used the word wolves that arise from within and come from without. Here's what I know. There are people that will divide. Don't be a divider. Be a uniter. There are people that are going to teach false teaching and they're going to be troublemakers. And then there are goats. Um, Matthew 25, 32, and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. And just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And the point there is that there are some people that just because they are around sheep, in other words, they go to church, they're not an actual sheep. Now, my, my desire is not to make you doubt your salvation. In fact, I really do believe that uh, 
the, that when you become a follower of Christ and you truly understand it, you're going to be very confident of your salvation. But I also know there are a lot of people that struggle with that. There are people that will sin and then they think, I must not be a Christian. And so the question then becomes, are you a sheep or are you a goat? The fact is, um, we're not sheep because of our effort. We're not sheep because we do certain things. We're sheep because of Jesus and we put our faith and our trust in him. And when you do that, when you do that, listen, the Bible is clear. God answers that prayer every single time. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, that's a faith thing, that's a belief thing, that's a trusting in Jesus thing. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have a master's degree from some seminary. You don't have to be a a teacher, a small group leader. You just have to believe. And thank God, every one of us can be that kind of seed. We die to our own selfish way of thinking. We're resurrected through our faith in Jesus Christ. We grow and we produce fruit. Heavenly Father, help us to be hundredfold people. Help us to be 100%. Help us to be all in. And God, we thank you for what you're doing in this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.